Welcome to the Fix Hangout. We have matriculated from Florida to North Carolina. The rain has followed us. Uh, I'm Chris Elizabeth of the Washington Post. Thank you for joining me. A star-studded group uh, this evening. I want to start with Guy Cecil, uh, the executive director of the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee. Guy, thanks for making time. Next to uh, me uh, is Ed O'Keefe, uh, my colleague at the Washington Post. We have in the Google pod, that is a technical term, uh, Mary Curtis uh, from, I want to make sure I get all of these titles, a contributor to the She the, to she the People and The Root. Uh, she's also based in Charlotte, so Mary will be giving us uh, restaurant recommendations at the end of this. Uh, and we have Patricia Murphy of The Daily Beast and a contributor to the She the People and my very longtime friend at home <laughs> in Atlanta. Okay, uh, I will open this up for everyone to pillory guy with questions, but since uh, uh, it's called The Fix Hangout, I get to go first. Um, all right, guys, tell me... Uh, you are the person in charge of trying to keep uh, control of the Senate, which looked like a very iffy proposition a year ago. Uh, it still looks like basically a 50-50 proposition. Tell me where uh, you think things are today. Uh, I assume you don't think it's lost, but tell me if, if there's one, tell me broadly where you think you are today, and then what are the one or two states, for somebody who doesn't follow stuff that closely, that they really should pay attention to, because those are the races that kind of are going to swing things. Sure. Well, clearly from where we started in January of last year, uh, we've made a lot of progress. I think most prognosticators, uh, most activists would look at the Senate map where we were defending 23 seats. Right. The Republicans were only defending 10 seats. A lot of those were in red and purple states uh, that we picked up in the wave election of 2006 and thought that our chances were remarkably small. And as time has progressed, uh, despite the fact that there's been so much outside money against us, I do think today it's a 50-50 proposition, maybe a little bit better. Uh, in large part uh, because we've managed to recruit some great candidates around the country. We've stayed relatively financially competitive, although certainly being outspent in some of our key battleground states. And frankly, I think the Republicans have made some mistakes in terms of who they've nominated and sort of how they're prosecuting the case against our candidates. For those that are casual observers right. like me and you. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> who don't spend all their waking hours uh, thinking about these things. I think the two races that are going to be somewhat determinative um, and the most interesting are the Massachusetts Senate race and the Virginia Senate race. Yeah. Uh, Virginia has been uh, pretty much a tied election. It's amazing. Uh, two since former the field governors in the race. You have George Allen, who lost his Senate race in 06, right. but it served as governor. Tim Kaine, former Democratic National Committee chairman and, and a former and governor. And former governor. Both incredibly well known. Um, I think that election will end up being determined by women. Uh, particularly in the suburbs of D.C. and Richmond, but it's going to be a very close election, although I'm optimistic. And then Massachusetts, uh, part of our election success, this cycle depends on our ability to uh, be aggressive about Republican seats around the country and not just to play defense, not just to defend Democratic mm -hmm. seats. This is clearly a race that has gotten an enormous amount of attention. And money. Uh, and money. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you have Amazing. the two highest raisers in the country. Ultimately, I think there are two things that are interesting about this race. Number one, about 800,000 more people will turn out in this election mm -hmm. than turned out in the special election where Scott Brown won. And the second is that in all of the public polling and in our private polling, when you look at people that are undecided in the Senate race, they are likely to be for Obama by a three or four to one margin. Hmm. In other words, they so are voters that we Democrats should be able should to. Win. Yes. Yeah. So I think those two, if you told me how they were so going to go. Massachusetts and Virginia. Those are yeah. good. I probably would have picked those two as well. Let me ask you one more and then I'll open it up. I want to sure. talk more broadly about the party and the state of the party. This, sure. these, it, it, if, if good for nothing else, conventions are good for a little <laughs> navel gazing and figuring out yes. where we were four years ago and where we are today. Now, four years ago, uh, a little more than four years ago, you were brought in and, and, and served in a very senior role in the, the Clinton uh, primary campaign yep. against Barack Obama. Um, a rift, uh, not you personally, but a rift, the Clinton and the Obamas, a rift in the party that everyone says is healed. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any lingering effect? Bill Clinton is speaking tomorrow night. It, 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 has, every, has, has everyone made nice nice? Yes. The short answer is yes. The long answer is yes. I. Um, first of all, I think the president has not only is not only speaking tomorrow, the former president, but is uh, traveling around the country on the stump, raising mm -hmm. money. Uh, certainly, I think you know Secretary Clinton has done a remarkably good job as Secretary of State. Uh, the fact of the matter is, if you remember in the last convention, the storyline that was developing the day before, I remember both, it well. Both the secretary and the former president spoke was. Are they going to, you know, are they really going to give it a good sell? Totally. And they, they both knocked it out of the park. And now 
you know, there's, you know, growing stories about how the president's going to do and the former president's going to do and he hasn't, you know, shown his speech to the Obama campaign. I think I'm not one for raising expectations prematurely, but I think that President Clinton will do a remarkable job tomorrow. And uh, the rift, to the extent that there was one, is healed. Okay, let me open it up. Ed, sure. Mary, Patricia, jump in. If you have a question for Guy, I think he can answer almost anything. I'm, I'll, I'll vouch for him. <laughs> let me ask I have you a, first. I have, well, well, let me ask go you ahead. first. Go about, ahead, Ed, and then Mary. Go let ahead. Let me ask sure. you first about the fact that there are two uh, contests that you guys are feeling much more confident about yeah. now. Uh, if you are a novice and only paying attention a little bit, those that pay attention a little bit more are now looking at North Dakota yep. and New Mexico. Yep. Why are you guys so confident? What has happened there? Well, I'll take New Mexico first because I think it's the most straightforward. New Mexico is a Democratic-leaning state. Uh, the president has, I think, a, a pretty strong lead there. You have the largest Hispanic electorate in the country, and we've seen uh, the the polls recently on how electorate in the country. Voting. That's interesting. I yeah. didn't know that. Huh. And um, and I think the most notable thing is that my counterparts, the National Republican Senatorial Committee, just pulled their entire fall by from the state. So I feel very good about. And that we believe in the parlance of our world means. Yeah. If they haven't given up on it, they're certainly not as optimistic as they want. I think that's a good way to put it, uh, the fairest way you could put <laughs> it. Uh, North Dakota, look, no one gave us a shot in North Dakota. Uh, and then Heidi Heitkamp got on the race, and people were still a little bit skeptical. But here's what we know. Uh, she is today in all of our internal polling, uh, since she got into the race, have been in the lead. Uh, again, one, two, three points, but in the lead. And uh, the other thing about Heidi is she hasn't been in elective office for a decade. And her name ID is still 90%, and she still has a net favorable rating, positive rating of about 20 points. I mean, people like her, uh, they remember her fondly. Sometimes we underestimate uh, the importance of that Especially in politics. in a small state, yes. too, I would say. I mean, it, I mean I it's, a big right. state, it's a big state by geography, but a small state by population. And again, just population. looking at the money, you know, Carl Rose Group has been running ads against her. The NRSC has just made a, a large buy in the state. So they're not, they're not spending money in a place that they think is already over. That's right. I think it's going to be a close race and oh. go right down to the wire. Uh, Mary, jump in. Sorry about that. Go ahead. No, that's okay. It was going to be all about the economy, but now we're talking about the impact of the Ryan budget plan on the lives of individuals. We're talking about a woman's right to choose and how some of these state races are being nationalized by these issues. How is that going to have an effect on the outcome of the contests? Well, just taking the Ryan budget first, I think the, the fact of the matter is that the Ryan budget is about the economy. Uh, for a 50-year-old, 54-year-old uh, senior who's thinking about whether or not Medicaid uh, and Medicare are going to be there for her, Medicare is an economic argument. Uh, when you look at Social Security, when you look at Pell Grants and the fact that the Ryan budget does everything in its power to eviscerate the Pell Grant program, for a lot of voters, that's an economic issue. So I don't think discussing Medicare or Social Security or Pell Grants is uh, anything other than an economic discussion. And then in terms of issues around choice and around contraception, which have been uh, in the news a lot. It, look, my own view is that women can walk and chew gum at the same time, uh, that they can care about both choice and contraception, and they, can and they can care about the economy. And I don't think that we have to choose uh, making both of those arguments to voters around the country. And Patricia, go ahead. Yeah, I had a quick question, and I'm glad uh, I can I can walk and chew gum at the same time. Excellent, so good, good. Confirmed. The <laughs> There's one. Your theory is <laughs> playing Please. itself out. I have proven right so far. <laughs> I've seen Mary. I've seen Mary do it too. So you've got your two for two so far. I have Chris to, has I a real problem doing it. I can't. No, so. no, yeah. You're Everybody who knows me knows that I can't. Thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> I know. And th this is to me just the cheap candy of the election cycle. But what's going on in Missouri? I think that a lot of people watching that race thought that when Todd Aiken finished opening his mouth that was sort of the end of him in the race but what where is the race as far as you stand sure. and does the path to 50 keeping the senate at 50 depend on that race yep so just so you know i worked in missouri in 2000 uh when governor carnahan and bob holden were running and then in 2006 i worked at the ds when we recruited uh, claire mccaskill to run for the senate the one thing folks don't understand about Missouri is once you get below sort of the St. Louis, Kansas City line, you really are in a very culturally and socially conservative part of the country. And it resembles the South much more than I think it resembles a lot of the industrial Midwest. And so my own view is that uh, folks wrote the obituary on Todd Aiken too early. Uh, we are preparing for a very close election. We think it will be close. 
and uh, and we're gearing up Look, as guy, this that's the case. Just, just, to, just very quickly. Yeah. There is no question that you are better off today in that race than you ever oh. thought you would be. I mean, I'm not saying sure. you don't think it's close, but this was a race, I will say from my perspective, I assumed you were going to lose, yeah. and this is now not a race I would assume you were going to lose. Well, look, I think that was in part decided not only by what Todd said, but the fact that uh, the Republican primary voters in Missouri, yeah, they picked them, despite right. the fact that he was outspent by John Bruner by a significant amount of money, decided he was going to be their candidate. And so I think that's the first step in making the race more competitive. And obviously what he said is out of line and out of bounds, and everybody has said so, and he has said so. Um, the fact is he said it. But the other fact is that that's only one extreme position that Todd Aiken holds. And I think we're going to prosecute the case on a whole number of fronts, and it won't just be about this and one issue. And he appears to be willing to let you prosecute the case, because at least as of right now, and I think he has until the end of September to yep. formally, finally say no. I think that's right. There's no indication he's doing so. Uh, not yet. Ed, quickly. Are you spending any more money in Missouri than you were already? Uh, we have already made our reservation uh, for television in Missouri, uh, so that's pretty much set. And we've invested in the state party already. We've been moving money there to prepare. And frankly, we were doing that before the primary was settled. So I think whether Todd Aiken stays in the race or not, it's going to be a competitive race. It may be more competitive slightly if he's in the race, uh, but I think it's going to go down to the wire. And I don't think it's necessarily required in order for us to hold the Senate, going back to our question. Yeah. But I do think... Um, it's obviously a pretty key factor if we're able to hold on to that seat. Now, let me, uh, I want to end uh, before, and Mary, we are going to get food recommendations from you, so do not leave. <laughs> but before uh, we do that, Guy, I want to end on one thing. Uh, Dick Durbin, uh, Senator from Illinois, yep. uh, was in uh, talking to Ed, actually, this morning. Uh, I want to play a little bit of what he said about the expectations game in the Senate. and sure. we'll, we'll come back. We'll, we'll try to pin you down. <laughs> When you look across the board at our candidates, Tammy Baldwin is tied in Wisconsin. We think we're going to win that race. Uh, I mentioned to you, you mentioned Heidi Heitkamp in North Dakota, Shelley Berkeley in Nevada at this point. Sherrod Brown is ahead. And I can go through the long litany of that. It's going to be very close in the set. It's going to be two votes up, two votes down as far as I'm concerned. We're watching it carefully, closely. Uh, we think we have great opportunities with some extraordinarily good candidates. So two votes up, two votes down. Uh, you guys currently have a three-seat majority. Yep. Uh, is the most likely scenario that you lose seats but hold your majority? Yeah, look, I am not one to make predictions. Uh, mm. And there I'm are stunned. A lot. I know. Stunned. It's not going to happen. We can go now. The uh, booker told me that you I know. know. Well, the booker <laughs> needs to be. But look, I, I do think the, the point that Senator Durbin made is inherently correct. It's going to be a very close election. Uh, the fact is we walk into this election cycle with over twice as many seats as the Republicans do in a lot of red and purple states. Uh, but I feel better about where we are today, and I think it's more likely that we will be two up than we will be two down when all the uh, dust is settled. There's okay. a slightly different way to ask it. Yep. Are there, how many more Democratic women will be in the Senate? Uh, I actually think five are going to be. Um, I think our women in, in these races are some of our strongest, uh, our strongest candidates. Maisie Hirono in Hawaii I think is likely to win. Uh, Shelly Berkeley um, has been in a very tight race in a state with a growing Hispanic population. Uh, I think Elizabeth Warren has a great chance of winning. Tammy Baldwin has a great chance of winning. And Heidi, as you mentioned, is uh, in a margin of error race. So I think they all have a great chance to win. And it would be uh, the single largest class of women That'd be five uh, in Democratic the history women. of the Democratic Party, which is something we're pretty proud of. Uh, we will end on that with the exception of it is literally a torrential downpour <laughs> outside. So I give credit to the Google folks for somehow making this work. Mary, give us one if you're on an expense account place to eat and one <laughs> if you're Chris Not. Eliza place to eat. One downscale, one upscale. Well, uh, for I, I have to live in this city and I know everybody <laughs> here. I, so I am going to defer to the the presidential teams and the candidates of Barack Obama and Mitt Romney. They are here so often trying to win North Carolina's 15 electoral votes, they probably go out to eat more than I do. So, right, so I I'll, would just... <laughs> so I'll ask Barack Obama next time I see him, when I have my sit down, I'll ask him where to eat. I'm sure he'll be keenly, keenly interested in that. Uh, Mary, well, Cur <laughs> Mary Curtis, Patricia Murphy, uh, uh, and joining me on set, Ed O'Keefe, Guy Cecil, thank you. We will be back tomorrow night, hopefully, unless we're all washed away in what can only be expected to be a huge, it is pouring here, folks. So stick with us. Thanks for hanging out with us. Have a good night. See you tomorrow at Thank 6. You, and See make you. sure, Thank you. check out WashingtonPost.com. Just hit refresh on your page and you can watch the entire night of convention coverage live. Au revoir.
Thanks, guys.